Thanks for everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Mike Moyer, and uh, a few years ago, I founded a company called CapEx, which is a school, a company that helps students find the right college. And uh, it's still in existence, and it has lots of lots of customers. And as a result of that, I, I wrote a book about getting into college. And I have a lot of clients who come to me for help, looking for help getting into colleges like Stanford. And I always tell them to apply to Stanford, not just because it sets the standard high, but because everybody that I've ever met that went to Stanford really likes going to Stanford. So it's always been one of my, uh, I've always wanted to come here, and I'm, it's a pleasure to be here, because this is a school that I recommend all the time, and I hope that, uh, uh, I know that Stanford keeps University of Chicago and Northwestern good, and I hope that we help you stay good, too. So uh, thanks for having me. We're going to talk about slicing pie, which is a method for determining a perfectly fair equity split in a startup company. How many of you are in startup companies today? Or anticipate being in startup companies? Or have been in startup companies? Have you ever had a partner and it didn't work out? A few of you? So some of you are going to your first startups, apparently. I've been in and out of startup companies my entire career, and I've always really enjoyed it, but I've had trouble with my partners along the time, and not because I didn't pick the right partner, because I did the wrong deal. And what we do is we go into it all gung-ho. Let's start a company. Let's start a business. Let's start a business together. And we've got to ask ourselves, why do you start a company? Why do you start a company? Why are you starting your company? No answer. Anybody have an answer why they're going to do this? Cash money. Change the world. Cash money, changing the world. What else? See what I can do. See what you can do, what you're capable of doing. What else? Be your own boss. Be your own boss. Does anybody think this sounds like fun? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to have hard work now. We're going to work really hard now. It's going to be fun along the way, and someday we're going to get a big payout. Versus, because I can go work for a company, right? And I've done this many times. I've gone to work for companies, but it's not nearly as much fun, right? But there's a big payout there, too. So it's a com com combination of the fun and the big payout. The problem is this. How much are you going to get paid out? Who's in a startup right now, they said? How much is your payout going to be? Good question. <laughs> You're in a startup right now? What's the payout? Come on, who's got the payout? Has anybody tried to figure out what their payout's going to be? $100 million, <laughs> so you got a number. <laughs> it could happen, right? This place has produced that kind of money before, right? Have you tried to figure out how much it's going to be worth? How have you tried to do this? Compared against other alternatives. Compared against other alternatives, what else? So comps, build a financial plan. That's right. <laughs> Does it look something like this? Losing money, kind of flat line, then you... And right here is the hostile takeover of Google in year three. A <laughs> lot of assumptions. We build in assumptions on top of assumptions on top of assumptions on top of assumptions, trying to figure this thing out. Because you don't know what that is. We don't know how much we get. We don't know how much we're worth. We don't know that. It's impossible to figure out this number. Yet people try to do it all the time. There are whole industries built around just this problem alone. How much is it going to be worth? It, for years, people have been trying to figure this problem out, trying to foresee the future in a very accurate way, and we cannot do it. So what I propose is this calculation, which I call the perfectly fair equity split. The portion of your business that you should get is equal to the value of your contribution divided by the total value that, that everyone contributed. So the value of your contribution divided by everybody's contribution, the value of that. Does that make sense? Anybody, does anybody agree with this number? Anybody disagree with this number? You disagree with it? Yeah. How do you define the value of your contribution? That's a really, really good question. Really good question. That's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> and the answer is, if you want me to give you the punchline now, you can't. <laughs> we're going to try. Most companies today do fixed equity splits. A fixed equity split is what 67% of companies do. They, they split the equity at the outset of the venture. It's the first deal people do. Our first real negotiation is what we're going to get. Has anybody done that yet? 
Then we sat, you guys sat down and had an equity split discussion yet? Pre-discussion. Do you have an idea of what it might be? Is it just you two? No, I've got one person. A couple people. Yeah. Who's a, who's a, who has an equity split right now? Anybody have in the company that has an equity split already? You are not making the mistake that 67% of the companies do make, because most of them do it early on. And they do a fixed equity split. 90% <coughs> of people do fixed equity splits. 90% of the companies do this. So it's going to be 50-50 is the most common. 60-40, because it's kind of my idea, so I'm going to take a little bit more than you, but you're still good, so you can get 40%. 80-20, well, it was my idea. I've been working on it for a couple of years, so I'll give you 20%, because I'm so much smarter than you. 25-25, four good friends. We're all going to do exactly the same amount of work, no matter what. We're just so good friends. 25-25, just split it up. That's what we're going to do. Off to the races. So we figure we can do 50-50 now. We're going to work hard. Everything's going to go great. We're going to hit on all cylinders. We're going to sell this thing for $100 million, right? 50-50, 50 million bucks each, right? Everyone's happy, right? No problem. But what if, what if you want to quit the job? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't think we're going to buy out Google in year three. What if you do all the work? So we go in 50-50, you and I, 50-50, and then you do all the work, what happens? What if you're an engineer and I'm a marketing person and we got to hire another engineer? Does it come out of you or does it come out of me? Because they're helping you, they're not helping me, right? So what happens if one of these things happens? What do you have to do about your equity? Has it do what? Reevaluate. Re renegotiate. How many people love to renegotiate things? They love to go say, we did a good deal. We thought it was going to work out great. We're going to go back to the drawing table, and we're going to figure it out again. And someone's going to come out with less than they had before. And someone's going to come out more than they had before, right? That's what renegotiation is. So what's going to happen is this. Someone's going to have your share. It's going to be greater than when something changes. When someone quits, someone goes somewhere, someone does anything, anything changes. And the one thing I like to say about startup companies is the only thing that does not change about startup companies is the fact that they're always changing. They always change. So what's going to happen? The minute something changes, the second something changes, the second you sign the dotted line, 50-50 split, the second you walk out the door, this is going to be true. One of you is going to have more than your fair share. Who's okay with this? Who wants to have more than their, raise your hand if you want to have more than your fair share. <laughs> People in the back. Does anybody who did not raise their hand want to work with these people as partners? Because <laughs> that's a real thing, right? That's a real instinct, right? I really want to, I want to have the most, right? That's a, that's a thing. I want to have it. We love getting a deal, right? So there's always a handful of people that are okay with the top equation. Is anybody okay with this? Your share is less than the value of your contribution divided by the total value? Anybody okay with that? Any real generous people here? I'm going to err on the side of generosity. I'm going to give you a little extra because you're my friend. Anybody okay with that? It depends on big company. It does. But right now it's a startup company, right? Right now it's worth how much? Zero. zero. The fact that you said that shows me you're going to be successful. Because you realize that it's worth zero at the beginning, that's what it's worth. But what we do is we do our calculations and our assumptions. We go, no, 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 no. This thing is worth so much money. I can't believe it. I can't believe how much money. It's hundreds of million dollars. <laughs> it's so exciting how much, God, we, this idea is so great. It's really worth zero until you do something with it. So when you go into a renegotiation or negotiation, you're actually doing this. I call it an alligator pit. There are less than gators and greater than gators. These are alligator pit negotiations. And how do we approach an alligator pit? Has anybody ever approached an alligator pit or seen an alligator pit? Would anybody like to dip into an alligator pit? If you were dipping into an alligator pit, what would be your thoughts going through your head? No ideas? How about self-preservation? First and foremost, I'm going to look at fear, anxiety. You're going to fight like you're, never, you're going to fight the gator like you've never done before. If you go into a negotiation where gators exist, less than gators and le greater than gators, you're going into an alligator pit negotiation. This is what most of us do. We both go into the art these negotiations with this kind of fear about how we're going to divide up our equity. And it's a big deal, and it happens all the time in startups across the world. 
and getting over this fear is almost impossible. So much p fear in this decision that some people don't even move forward. And if it's not fair, it's not fun. And this is where your relationships start deteriorating. You thought you were good friends, but all of a sudden it wasn't fun anymore. Things start kind of sucking, so you start, you start falling apart. So what we need is this. We need a perfectly fair system. Not a kind of fair system, not a sort of fair system. We need a perfectly fair system. We want to reward participants for contributions that they make, not contributions that they say they're going to make. If you go into a startup company and someone says, all right, I'll give you 25% of the company to join my company, that is the same thing as saying to someone, you're going to join my company, I'm going to pay you $100,000 a year, you're going to be here about five years before you find a better job, so I'm going to give you $500,000 on day one. That make sense? Has anybody ever taken a job where they've given your entire compensation on day one? If that happened, how, and you, and you flaked out the next day, what would happen? Would you give me my money back? If I spent a little bit of it, it's going to be hard to get it back. But by giving someone an equity share before they do any work, it's the same thing as giving them, uh, as, as giving them their salary up front. So you want to reward people for the actual contributions they make. Not what they say they're going to do, what they actually do. You want to provide ongoing motivation to continue contributing. So you have to have a way to reward someone for staying in the system, for con but continuing to be part of our startup. We want to accommodate additions or subtractions to the team, which happens all the time. Flexible in the face of rapid change, because we're changing and changing and changing. And we want to get rid of the gators. We don't want any alligators in our negotiation. We've got to get rid of the less than gators and the greater than gators. Any questions so far? The solution is using what's called a dynamic equity split. Has anybody ever heard of dynamic equity splits? A couple people. A dynamic equity split is just as it sounds. It's, it's, it's an equity program that's, that changes over time. It's dynamic. It, equity is awarded over time. Now, a dynamic equity split is not necessarily a new concept. And in fact, uh, there's some folks at Harvard who have identified this as one of the biggest ways to solve this problem. What's more difficult is how to actually implement a dynamic equity split. And I'm going to show you how to implement a dynamic equity split today in a way that's going to be very logical, very straightforward, very easy, and you're going to avoid going to the negotiation table every time you want to figure this out. So we're going to work hard now, and we're going to get exactly what we deserve later on. Your share is going to be in proportion to what you contributed. So if you contribute 50%, you're going to get 50%. If you contribute 10%, you're going to get 10%. If you contribute 23.2%, you're going to get 23.2%. No more and no less. You're going to get exactly what you deserve. This is a one-size-fits-all, universal way to divide up equity in an early-stage bootstrapped company. And it will be perfect. Because fair equals fun. Your startup will be fun. You're not going to have to worry about this piece of it. You can move forward <coughs> on day one. I do a number of things in my professional life besides teaching. I also do uh, a little bit of angel investing. And I wrote this model to outline the terms that I wanted to invest in companies. And I wanted to create something that says, instead of us going through a big financing deal, we're just going to agree to these rules and we're going to move forward. And all we have to do is agree to the rules and move forward. And everything's going to be OK. And I'll show you how it works. It's called a grunt fund. These are grunts. We can't predict actual value. We can't predict real value. We can't actually understand what the potential value is. All we can do is guess. But we can assign a theoretical value. So the step one is assign a theoretical value to the various inputs provided by each participant. And I'm going to show you today how to calculate theoretical value. It is a pretend made up number. Because we can't figure out actuals, we're going to create a proxy for that value, replace that value with a proxy that's going to tell us exactly how much we should get. So step number one, the theoretical value of each piece of, uh, for each participant. Share number two, your share equals the theoretical value of your contribution divided by the total theoretical value. This is the calculation that makes this work. And we're going to allow it to self-adjust over time. It's called, that's why it's dynamic. So the challenge is how do we assign <coughs> theoretical value? Startup financials are based on assumptions, 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 guesses and assumptions and crazy ideas and they're great one day, they're wrong the next day, and everyone has a different opinion on them. Theoretical values are based on v easily observable, readily observable things in the marketplace, things that we actually know, dollar amounts we actually know. Here's how it works. 
So there's all kinds of stuff you contribute to a startup company, right? There's time, there's money, there's ideas, there's relationships, there's credit, loans, there's equipment, there's supplies, all kinds of stuff we contribute. The biggest one is what? Time. time. Most of it's just time, and especially in tech companies, a lot of time. What about, is there lab space, engineering? Students, do you need a lab? Office supplies, things like that? All kinds of contributions. Mentors coming in and going all the time. So each one of these has a theoretical value, even cash and ideas. This is one of the biggest arguments we get is how much is my idea worth? Here's how you develop the theoretical base value of time. It's your negotiated base salary minus cash compensation times two divided by 2,000 that gives you your grunt hourly resource rate. Grrr. Now here's how it works. Has anybody ever had a, had a real job here? <laughs> couple, couple folks. In that real job, were you paid for it? In that real job, did they give you equity in the company as well? In that, some, someone did get equity? Yeah. So a couple of equity people? So the folks that didn't get equity, are you angry? Yes. You're angry you didn't get equity? So we've got, so we got two out of three. Out there in the world, there's a number, people like you, and there's a number for everyone in this room. The number is the number that you're willing to work for without getting any equity whatsoever. It's your fair market rate. It's the rate at which you are willing to work for without getting any equity at all. Hey, you pay, pay my full market sal salary? I'm happy. I go home, I buy my house, buy my cars, buy my stuff, and I don't need equity. There are lots of companies in this area that do that all the time. That's the main way people get hired is we pay you what your market rate is, and that's what you get. And in that market rate, it will account for your experience, your great ideas, your charisma, your loyalty, all that stuff. Your education, all these things that make you valuable will be reflected neatly in your market value, in your market rate. Now, the best way to maintain 100% ownership of your company is just to pay people. If I'm paying you your full market rate, paying your full market rate, there's no expectation of equity. In fact, I have people who work for me full time. I pay them their market rate and then some. They know what I'm busy. They know what I do for a living. They, they're not, I'm not kidding anybody. They know exactly what I'm up to. But they're not upset because I'm paying them their full market rate. And that's fair. If I pay your full market rate, I get to keep everything. But if I don't pay your full market rate, I have to compensate you. And equity is the tool we use. So I'm going to subtract whatever I pay you in cash. I'm going to multiply it by two. This is a multiplier that I made up based on my experience to reflect the risk that you're taking. Are you risking anything when you take a job at a startup company? What are you risking? The previous job, you're risking something very specific when you take a job with a startup company. And that risk is that you're not going to get paid. In fact, you're probably not going to ever get paid. The chances of you not getting paid are almost 100%. So that's a big risk. So I put a big premium on it. I put times two, 100% premium. And I divide by 2,000, which is roughly the number of hours in a year that gives you your grunt alley resource rate. That is the unit of measure that we're going to use to calculate our equity split. And it reflects what the theoretical relative time value of our time is. My time relative to your time. Any questions on that so far? Here's an example. If my market rate is $100,000, you either pay me $100,000 cash or you've got to compensate me some other way. I get paid $25,000, which puts $75,000 at risk, meaning I'm probably not going to collect that. I multiply it by two, which is $150,000. Divide by 2,000, I get a grunt hourly resource rate of $75 an hour. The relative value of my time is $75 an hour. Do you adjust it? Do you expect people to put in far more than 2,000 hours a year? Do I adjust it? Yeah. No. They just keep racking it up because it's the same calculation for everything. Does that make sense? In a startup, you might work 4,000 hours, but you'll just keep racking up at 75 bucks an hour. It's, uh, relative to everybody else, it'll still work out the same. It's a good question. I think it's a good question. I don't know. Is that a good question? <laughs> what about for people who are not working for you full-time? How do you compensate that? For example, like part-time co-founders or consultants that you hire? Same way. Consultants are a little bit different. I can talk about that later um, because there's no expectation of long-term employment. 
which means you have to you know, have a buyout, right? It's a little more complicated. But you still get, this is great for part-time people because that's why you give them an hourly rate instead of an annual rate. Well, they're risking the not going out to the beach that day. So people are all taking risks. They may not <coughs> take as much risk, which means they're going to get a lower share of equity. Did that sufficiently answer your question? Small amounts of money, cash, four times a dollar amount of cash. Cash is worth a lot more than your time. Why would it be worth more than your time? What? Nothing happens. It's easier to make 10 bucks or to save 10 bucks? It's much, it's much easier to save it or to make it? To earn it or save it? Most of us have a lot harder time saving money than we do making money. We make money, spend it, make it, spend it, make it, spend it. So it's much harder to come by cash. We put a premium on cash. Cash is king. We've got to have cash. We've got to put a big incentive. So it's dollar amount times four as the money is spent on the business. If I give you a million dollars, is it at risk? Because I trust you, right? And it's sitting in your bank account. I can say, can I have my money back? And you say, sure, give me money back. So it's not at risk until it's spent, until it's gone. When it's gone, we multiply it by four in the model. So as the money is spent, we multiply it by four. We're rewarding actual contributions. Putting a million dollars into a company is a, not an actual contribution. People think it is, but it's not until it's actually spent that it actually becomes at risk. It's safe in the bank until it's actually spent. So dollar amount times four. So everything has a theoretical value. If it's a relationship, you've got a guy with a big Rolodex coming up at you, hey, this guy knows everybody in town, he can sell everything. Instead of giving him an advance of that equity, you say, all right, whatever you would otherwise earn in commission, we'll multiply it by two. That's your theoretical value of your, idea of your relationship. Your idea, your fantastic, brilliant idea, an idea is great if it generates revenues. If nobody buys your idea, no one gives you any money, you can't get any money because of your idea, then not really worth that much. So you put a royalty on it, which is an easily observable, natural way to reward someone's intellectual property, and multiply it by two. It supplies, either nothing if it's petty supplies, a laptop or a stapler, but if you incur expenses on behalf of the company, it's treated as cash. Everything that goes into the company, everything, can be measured in a, by creating a theoretical relative value to say, well, how much is this thing worth that's put at risk versus another thing? Your cash versus my time versus your idea versus your relationships. If it's a piece of equipment, capital equipment, if you purchase it, purchase it for the company, it's treated as cash. If it's something you kind of owned before, we're going to treat it at the sale price. If it's a used piece of equipment that you've had for years sitting in your garage, we treat it at the resale price. It's the price. You look at eBay and figure out what it is. Again, it's an easily observable number in the market. There's a cheat sheet I'd be happy to send you that has a calculation. The book that I wrote explains every calculation that there is. So I'll show you an example. Here they are, three grunts doing some work. We got grunt number one, junior developer right out of college, knows a little PHP, a little Ruby on Rails, doing a little development. The founder came up with the idea, some equipment, and some time. Didn't have enough money. Had to tap his rich uncle, rich uncle, brought some cash, some relationships, loaned the credit card, said, we'll make it work for you. Providing stuff. How do you say you value the idea? Royalty. Oh, so on revenues. You have to negotiate the royalty rates. Right. Royalty rates are, for different industries, are easy to observe. So if you're a public, if your book, book authors get about 5%, you know, some technology things get, you know, 5 to 10%. So all those things have, have, a, have a royalty rate that's standard, <coughs> which is a normal way to reward intellectual property. So here they all are, working hard. All you do is add up the individual's values. You get, you get what I call the theoretical base value, the TBV, theoretical base value, a pretend value that has nothing at all to do with the actual value of your company, but provides a way to do this calculation. It's a proxy for actual value. You divide up each person's share, the contribution grunt number one divided by the total, grunt number two and grunt number three, and that gives you a pie that looks like this. So at the end of period one, grunt number one, the junior developer who did a little PHP programming, owns about 2% of this company. Grunt number three, the rich uncle put a bunch of cash in, owns a lot, and the idea person, the founder, doesn't own as much, but that makes a lot of sense because 
relative to each other person and what people are putting at risk, it makes a lot of sense. I have some problems with the term idea. The poor guy who is only getting 2% and working four weeks of his ass off, he probably has a lot of ideas too, which actually make the product work, right? Yeah. So wouldn't you call this also an idea which he should be rewarded of? Because he's probably already got, maybe he has a very good idea which... <coughs> Right, but remember that negotiated base salary? That's the market value that encapsulates all your ideas. So for that amount of money, I'm, I'm buying your ideas for the company. So if you paid me $100,000 a year, all my great ideas belong to the company. When these folks work for a different company and they have great ideas, the company owns them. So in this case, the company is compensating you properly for those ideas. Now, sometimes someone comes into the company with an idea. The founder says, I want to start a company that takes pictures on my camera, on my, on my phone. That's a great idea, right? Yeah, so this might, if they, the, the founding father, so to speak, has, that's kind of a little bit different of an idea. Um, why was cash times four and time times two? Because cash is harder to come by and more important to a startup than, than, than time is. So you have to provide an added incentive. In order to get the cash flowing, you got to add, add a little extra weight to it. Compared to the equity that incubators take, incubators take a fixed, per random percentage. So it's whatever they got, it's either too high or too low, because there's, it's not grounded in any, most of the time. It's just sort of we give you a time and equity, you take five percent. They just pick a random number. Um, this is a more precise number. But that being said, there are a number of, equity of incubators that are using this model to determine their equity splits, especially in for-profit entities in a Nonprofit incubator, they usually don't take equity because the state doesn't let them do it. More questions? How to calculate a market rate for students who has no like, job? Uh, you look at similar jobs in the market. So if the student's going to be a marketing executive, you see you know, what, what does a typical Stanford graduate get in the market, and that's what you would call it. You, you don't have to split hairs too, too finely on this, um, but you have to get something that would be willing to accept a job. I, if I paid you $75,000 a year, Sure, uh, that's, it's, that's what's called a negotiated rate. Because you get the same problem as somebody might be a marketing executive worth $100,000, and their job is to clean the toilets in your new company. Well, that's more of a toilet cleaner job, not a marketing executive job. My question was, would you benchmark on a job that they previously had, and, or would it be something that they, when they say willing to take? You know, that's a pretty amorphous. Right, it's, you would benchmark with it, what, the market will, what the market will bear for their services. So if they've, have, if they've had 10 years experience and as a marketing executive, and they can be a marketing executive for your company, you can look kind of historically and see what, see what they've been willing to take. Um, but it's the same kind of process you'd go through negotiating a job rate for any job. So let's add a new guy. This is a sales guy. He brings some great relationships and puts some time in. Now we're going to assume for a moment that nobody else does any more work, just to make it simple. Guy's coming in, making rain. All we do is add his contributions to the base value. So now that denominator grows. And you rec recalculate everyone's share. Here's grunt number two, grunt number three, grunt number four. Here's our pie. So now grunt number three has a little bit less. Most people call this dilution. Now we've got grunt number two and four in there. Grunt number one, rounded up, still has a similar amount. But the company is now moving forward. They're getting revenues in there. They're getting a good salesperson. Things are moving forward. So that the company as a whole, hopefully, is worth more money. So even though they're just down for some people and up for others, it, it's all fair. It always keeps it perfectly in balance. Now, the next thing you got to worry about is what happens when you get rid of somebody. What's the, what do you do when you terminate someone? There are four reasons someone can be terminated. They can be fired for good reason. What's being fired for good reason? Not doing their job. Not doing their job is it's specific. It's you're not do your doing your job, warning number one. You're still not doing your job, warning number two. You're fired. It's warning, warning, fired. It's not you're fired. It's warning, warning, fired. It's not fair to fire someone without giving them a warning if they're not doing their job. It's perfectly fair to fire someone if you've given them a warning and they haven't shaped up. Why else can you fire someone? Stealing. Stealing. Selling the ideas to competitors, what else? What? Hold that thought. Hold that thought. They could bring a gun to work. 
threatening people, sexual harassment, all kinds of good stuff that you can just fire someone for. That's, you're not playing fair, it's out of here. But if it's performance related, you've got to give them some warnings. Now, you can fire someone for no good reason. Why would you get fired for no good reason? You just don't need them anymore. <laughs> you just don't need them anymore. It's not your fault. You came in, you did your job, just don't need you anymore. You don't need, maybe you don't need salespeople anymore and you thought something like that. I started a company and I th we, we decided that telemarketing was the way to go, right? Telemarketing, this is going to be so awesome. We need to sell this thing like crazy because I made a couple phone calls one day and they bought. So I thought this must be the way to do it. So we went and hired a whole my telemarketing staff, set it all up, and guess what? I was wrong. No one wanted to buy this thing over the phone. So I said to her, yes, you did your job. You did it right. You did exactly what we asked. But we, we're not going to do telemarketing anymore, so you're fired. You're fired for no good reason. You didn't provide me a good reason to fire you. You can resign for good reason. What's resigning for good reason? That's a good reason to you. What? That's a good reason for you. Good reason for you. <laughs> the companies are giving the opportunity to grow, like to perform what you've done. Closer. The company has made decisions that put you in a position where it's no longer the job you signed up for. So, we're in s the Bay Area right now. We're going to move this company to Boston. I want you to relocate your kids, your family to Boston. That's a good reason to resign. Or, guess what? You were the VP of engineering. Now we need someone to do this sweep the floor, so you're going to kind of sweep the floors now, and we're going to lower your salary. That's a, a material change in res title responsibilities and compensation. Those kinds of things, the company making decisions that are, make the company no longer what you signed up for, that is a good reason to resign. And companies make these decisions, and it's okay for them to make these decisions, but they've got to suffer the consequences of those decisions, and have to know the, the consequences. The last one is resigning for no good reason, which is Got a better job. Don't want to work for no money anymore. That, what? Need I need to get health care. Yeah, these are all good reasons for you, but the company is now what? The company's left in the lurch, right? We were working together and it's great. Yeah, then you quit on me. Ah, I got to hire someone new. Give me a break. So it's a decision that you make that hurts the company. So these are very different circumstances, but they have very meaningful ways to handle the equity in, in, this, in, this, in these types of uh, terminations. So, if you remove a grunt, you fire them for good reason, or they resign for no good reason. In both cases, the employee is making decisions that adversely affect the company. As a result, it hurts. They get no equity for the time they put in. You adjust your other inputs to the dollar amount, no multiplier. So this is where that 4x comes in play. Ouch, I went from 4x to 1x. Ah, that hurts. You can't steal someone's money. You can't say, give me a thousand bucks and fire them, keep your money. You gotta pay them back. It's not fair to keep their money, but you don't have to give them a premium on their money. You buy it back if possible, meaning if I have the cash in the bank and I give you a thousand bucks back, we part ways friends. You got fired for no good reason, you're whole again, we're out of here. And you can ask for a non-compete. Now in California, my gut tells me it's probably pretty hard to enforce a non-compete. But it doesn't matter. You ask for a non-compete anyway. Why? It's not fair to have this person quit your company or get fired and then go out and compete with you. And if the person has any moral fiber whatsoever, they should honor that non-compete. Now, if they resign for good reason because of a decision the company made or they get fi fired for no good reason, they just laid you off, it's different. They get to keep all the equity at the full theoretical value. They keep it. We'll buy it back if possible. We're going to give you four times your money back, two times your time back. That's a big chunk of change. It's expensive to buy back. Before the company lays somebody off, they should be aware of this, the, the repercussions. And we can't ask you to sign a non-compete. That doesn't mean you can't steal the company's ideas, but it does mean you can compete in the same industry. So the company incurs the pain there. So if you came and joined my company, put, gave in $1,000 and 1,000 hours, I paid you twice what your, mar your negotiated base salary was and four times your money back, that's okay. That's a pretty good deal. It's a lot more money you probably would have made in the company any anyways. So it's a, that's a fair transaction to get you out of the company. Or I'll just let you keep your equity. Who determines if it's a good reason for resigning? The ones that the company thought that it was a valid reason for the year. I do, because I wrote the book. <laughs> I determine it. Now, the, 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 the reasons are, are generally accepted 
legal reasons. Okay, sure. So it's you know it's relocation of the company more than 50 miles away, adverse change, and so those things are all they're generally accepted. Again, all these things are based on easily observable things, values, laws, all those things. It's, you know, just non-competes are easily observable, and what happens there. I had a, I worked for with a guy, a partner, who uh, wrote some contracts. He d had accelerated vesting in the event of resigning for good reason. It was an accelerated vesting schedule. So when people resigned, he said, okay, you're vesting, fully vesting. That, that's, that was cool, right? But then he said, oh, by the way, there was an operating agreement amendment we made two years after you signed the original one that allowed me to buy it back at face value, which is zero, unless you want to buy an audit. So I'm taking your equity back. And so he, sub he, he, he systematically pushed each one of the founders out of the company and took the equity back for himself. Does that sound fair? Does that sound like the kind of thing that would inspire a book like this? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> you got to do what's right for people. This isn't a legal thing, it's a moral thing. It's about doing right by the people who help you get where you're going. So let's show, this is what it looks like when you remove a grunt. So here they all are, working hard. <laughs> grunt number one, junior developer, slacking off. He got a warning, he got another warning, and he was fired, right? So here's what you do, you just take his contribution out of the pool. Just take it away. Remember, it's just a pretend number. He's no longer a contributor, so just take his numbers out. This doesn't matter. It's not actual value. It's just a way to calculate the equity. So you just take his out and recalculate everybody else. There's two, three, and four. And now the pie looks like this. Now everyone's got a little bit more, right? Because that number, that 2% is gone. But they're not necessarily better off because now they've got to hire a new developer. So again, it's dynamically adjusted. And it's still fair, but now they're a little bit worse off. For the adding a grunt, so is, isn't there something around the risk that you're taking when you start at the company versus coming in a year later? Because wouldn't you be getting, the, with this model, wouldn't you be getting the same proportion of equity for working from year one to year two and from working just for the first year? So the assumption that you're making, and I don't like assumptions, the assumption that you're making is that the company becomes less risky over time. Right? My position on that is while that may be true, it's unobservable. And in this model, you count what you can count. So let's say, for instance, year one, we get a big customer. We're going along great. We raise our money. At the end of year one, we're out of money and we lose our customer. Is it more risky or less risky? Things change so rapidly, you never can tell where you, where you stand. I was with a company where everything looked great. I was raising money. We had Tons of, we had hundreds of customers in there, we had cash flow, we had money coming in and everything, and then we lost our biggest customer. And the investor said, whoa. So the company looked like we were on, the, on, on, on a roll, and then all of a sudden a couple things, within a matter of days, changed the whole picture. So you just never know what the risk factor is. It's, it's almost impossible to tell risk on you know, publicly traded stocks, let alone a, a startup stock. So what I do is I don't, I don't take that into account. But it is common for people to think that. So in, in the um, case that you mentioned, junior developer happens to be a badass, right? So puts in six months of work. Badass good or badass bad? Good, good. Got a good badass. Yeah, good badass. Um, <laughs> puts in a lot of work. You, I mean, you're getting the full utility out of the work that they've put in, and it was only time compensation under your model. Right. So then they get a job after six months, and you still, you know, you've, you've gotten the benefit out of the work, and you're saying basically they shouldn't be compensated because it wasn't a good reason for them to that's, that, that is what I'm saying, but there's a way around it. We don't want, we need, as a startup company, we need retention programs. We need a way to retain people to work for our company. We can't just have them say, oh, we've got a better job, and then just leave us in the lurch. If that was the story, he built some great code, he gave us a lot of momentum, then he just bails, ah, that hurts the company, right? We might go out of business without that knowledge. But if the person agrees to stay on as an advisor, they can just drop down to the number of hours. And say, like, listen, you're a key contributor. We want you to stick around. So instead of just taking your equity back, you stick around and help us through the transition, then you keep it. So you've got to provide an incentive for someone to stay. So just like your question, this guy goes get a, gets a full-time job. He's still getting his hourly rate if he continues to, continues to participate. So there's some scenarios with the, which that would be appropriate. But if the guy's just like, screw you guys, I'm leaving, I'm... Eh. They get your equity. And remember, they sign up for this in advance. They know this is the pain they will endure. Is there a vesting concept in this that sort of alleviates that problem or not? 
Vesting is unnecessary in this model because it, it, all the protections are built in. Legally, this is a vesting schedule. In, 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 a, certain, in a certain corporate structure, in, in a C corp, for instance, you would issue restricted stocks and then it would vest according to the schedule. Um, but the traditional time based vesting doesn't apply here, it's not needed. This is a very straightforward system that most of the legal things that we use, the legal constructs that we use to protect ourselves against the unknown, aren't needed here because the protections are built in. I'm just trying to understand this. Um, so say somebody's putting in time for a full year and they're accumulating at that hourly rate but we're not paying them any base salary and then they, they leave for good reason. Like the, do they keep the accumulated value of that time that they put in? And that's if they, leave, if they leave for good reason, it stays in the pie. So they still retain that for yes. the equity. And if it's not good reason, we drop that value down, but they still retain some. We, whatever cash they put in, we put at the actual value. But time goes away. Under this model, it's painful to leave a company. Mm. So we do as it should be. Startups are very fragile places. And if you're failing on them, it's trouble. The multipliers help create that, that the, the disincentive for the company to push you out and an incentive for people to stay in the company. When do the shares actually vest? Like if, what if you're working on a company for like four years and you wanted to sell some of your shares to you know, get some liquidity? Could you do that? Uh, if you could do that anyway, you could do that. <laughs> I mean, in a startup company, you have a, might have a hard time doing that. Um, in different corporate structures, it's a different way. Um, and I have several attorneys that this is a big piece of their, comp their business. Um, in the C-Corp, the vesting happens according to the schedule, but there's also this buyback if it doesn't work out. In an LLC, I always recommend, we don't issue a lot of underlying equity because the equity tool is different. It's just a profit distribution or a proceeds distribution, so whatever can be distributed. If you need to get money back, if the, com the company can make a distribution to you and buy back some of your equity at that point, oh. or someone else could buy it. So I had an attorney who wanted to do this, but he was making $750,000 a year. Now, a startup company doesn't need a $750,000 a year attorney. So he hired, he paid a junior level attorney to do his work for him. And he advised that person, just took that guy's equity. Does that make sense? So somebody else paid it. Um, so what happens though, like with an early stage startup where like the founders might just have like a difference of opinions and one person, like it, it's for the best of the company that one person leaves just because the nature of people's opinions. Like how do you account for that in the system? Because it seems like the per like you have a disincentive to leave the company because you're losing equity at that point. If you agree that if, if, the, if the founders change the strategy enough that one person doesn't feel comfortable staying there anymore, mm -hmm. yeah, or then like that would be a re resignation. That, <laughs> like as a, like a founder, like it's more important that like some person gets replaced just because of skill sets, for example. Like as a company evolves, especially with the startup. Well, as a, so there's a couple of different things going on there. So let's say you and I, the three of us, start a company. And what was your name again? Christine. Christine. We decide that Christine, we don't want her anymore. She's not pulling her weight. So we could find a different place for her in the company, uh, or we could say, listen, you're doing your job, but you're, you're, you're fired for, for, for no good reason, and you, she keeps her equity. Now, that equity piece is going to shrink as everyone else earns against it, but whatever she put, the value is still going to be reflected. Now, if she's not doing her job, we can fire her and take it back. And let's say you and I are partners, you say, and we're just not getting along. Well, that, we could agree that was a resignation for, for a good reason and I will keep my shares. So uh, there's, there's a way to handle everything in those discussions. Just like you can always keep the person on as an advisor to help you work through the transition. Question. In this particular model, who actually owns the company and gets to make the firing decisions? Does, I mean, in this model, the rich uncle who put in the most money get fired the CEO from his own company? He could. The rich uncle doesn't want to. So it would usually be whoever the president of the company was. This does, there's this 51% thing that you're probably in your head right now. I got to own 51% so I can kind of make the decisions. I always tell entrepreneurs that sort of there's an illusion of control. Because the second you hire and you get any real cash into your company, that, that control is going to go away. You maintain control of your company by being a good leader, making good decisions. Um, but if Rich Uncle decided you weren't doing your job, Rich Uncle could push you out as he should be able to because he put all the money up and his money's at risk. He got the most at risk. Make sense? If you have enough cash just to fund your business, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But if you don't, you have to be willing to spread the risk out and be able to take, take on that responsibility yourself as well.
static split model, if you take on an additional grunt, does that assume you pay market value for them? In what static split model? So when you, at the beginning, you were talking about just st straight up 50-50 splits or 25-25-25, if you add additional people into that mix, uh, are they, do you assume that you pay them that fair market rate for each additional person, or can you adjust those? In the static model, we have to renegotiate every time. So you and I are in business, we want to bring in Sebastian, we got to say, all right, how much is it? We give him 10%, but I want it to come out of you, not me. So you, you now you have 40%, I have 50%, he has 10%. You say, no, 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 no. We're going to take 5% out of each. No, no, no. Why don't I take 7%? You take 3%. It's a negotiation every time. And the dynamic model adjusts automatically. It's, it's hey, come on aboard. <laughs> We're in. No problem. And in a fixed model, we've got to renegotiate all the time. That's an alligator pit negotiation. That's why I just tend to, tend to stick strictly out of those. Um, so this is, what, this is what we went over in the beginning. This is what we have at the end. So we've got it perfectly fair. The re contributions that are being made are being properly rewarded. We're accommodating changes in the team and the company, and there's no alligators. Everyone's getting exactly what they deserve at any given moment. I'm not too sure if we get rid of the alligators. It looks like we just have to switch the rooms, because now we have to know negotiate other things. I'm still puzzled with the idea thing, right? How do you value this? I mean, this can get a lot of trouble. So now we have to really evaluate if some, we have four guys and they all have ideas which contributed to one Ooh. thing, to now how to right. decide. So your, your struggle is around this idea that more ideas are being generated every day. The idea sort of refers to the founding idea. So if I have an idea to start a banana stand, then my idea to start a banana stand, is to the degree that it's intellectual property, I get a royalty on. If you saw dipping the bananas in chocolate on, on the job, that's not necessarily a, a, a royalty idea. But, but sometimes startups make a kind of a change in direction. They so start pivot. off with one idea and then they realize, hmm, but if we go this direction, right. so this is a major turn. They would make a pivot. And in that case, the guy that had the original idea that sucked wouldn't get a royalty, as he shouldn't. Okay. That makes sense? So this solves that problem. And we pivot all the time in startups. So I, my idea is to have chocolate-dipped squirrels, frozen squirrel stand. We all think that's a great idea. And we're going along, and we're not selling these chocolate-dipped squirrels. And someone says, I got an idea, I want to just, just dip bananas instead. And all of a sudden, that's, oh, that's a good idea. And then bananas start getting dipped. The guy who came with the squirrel idea is not getting rewarded for that dumb idea, <laughs> as he shouldn't be. Does this require you to keep hours worked or to adjust that over time? Yes, and that sucks. Okay. I hate tracking my hours. Okay. Do you hate tracking your hours? Yeah. Who here loves tracking their hours? A couple people, maybe you're in a turn. <laughs> This is a common complaint. Oh, I don't want to track my hours. It's so painful to track my hours, and it is. And there's a couple ways around that. The first one is you can track days, okay. or you can track your hours. And when you track your hours, you realize what you're spending your time on, and it's amazing to see the story unfold. A few weeks ago, I had a guy, there's an incubator in Chicago called 1871. It's this big deal, right? And it's people work, and it's so much fun to work there, they're not getting any more work done. And he's using this system. And he says to me, oh, we haven't got any sales. It's really frustrating. We're not doing any sales. So I said, let's look at your time sheets and guess how much time they were spending on sales. Yeah. They were doing development. They're talking to potential customers, doing research. They were doing email marketing. They're doing all kinds of stuff except for sales. So he said, all right, stop not doing sales and just do sales. And guess what happened? Yeah. They started getting sales. They right. got does some good then, sales. Um, does this then basically say that after six months, your time is more valuable, your time component is more valuable than it was after one month and after a year? That, that component continues to grow while like, cash injected only does if you're putting more cash in. Right. So you're diluting the uncle over time. Right. Okay. Uh, why would you tie the equity incentives to hours worked? You might get some bad behavior relative to Game in it, right? sales generated. If for a professional salesperson, you can agree that their compensation will be just on, on just commissions. Then you wouldn't put necessarily under, under, under in, in some scenarios, be, be, be a, it'd be a mix. Even for founders, like you could do a mix of like a sure. on scorecard of mm -hmm. actual activities that are generating value for the company. Right. And there's also, uh, there's an incentive to, to game it, right? Yeah. I'm going to pad my hours, right? And that comes up sometimes, but that's a management issue. And if you're tracking your time, you can tell if someone's spending too much time on a task. Say, listen, you're spending a lot of time on a task. So you have management issue, people messing around, which is the same issue you have with a fixed split, but you just don't recognize it because you're not tracking hours. 
but you can structure your compensation with, with whatever is logical for the firm. So if the CEO is a selling CEO, then it would be logical to build in more commission. If the CEO is more of a production CEO or operations CEO, you wouldn't do that necessarily. Do you have companies who, who overlay this time equity system with other performance incentives for in like the cash compensation? I don't know. No one's told me they have. What about, um, what about the value of someone bringing a team together? Like the person who is the one who is like, we're gonna make this happen, making it happen, H how do you value that? Because I, I feel like that, that's a pretty big value in a startup. That is a value. And that's usually the person with the idea comes, brings it all together. That, that's where that royalty, that's where that payout becomes. It's, called, it's usually called the idea person. So I can form an idea for an advertising agency, which is a, not a unique idea, right? But I can still take a royalty on the idea because it's sort of my idea, and that kind of rewards the person for that initial action, putting the ball in motion. That's kind of how that can be used. So, so it, it would be like when you compare it to a comp of like, I came up with an idea for like a new pizza box, and yeah, I just sold it without doing anything. Right. Then there'd be some royalty premium on actually putting together a team to execute mm -hmm. it. Right. So idea doesn't always refer to legal intellectual property. It, 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 it's, it's, the, it's the act of putting this thing together in motion. But if the idea is dipping squirrels in chocolate, you may not want to get a royalty for that. Thanks for getting the team together, pal, but your idea sucked. And we're lucky enough to pivot and we stay in business, so. So what about the equivalent of promotions and getting your salary raised in a company? Because we're talking about the junior, the junior guy who just came out of college and he started with a lower salary. But then after four years, in theory, he's worth more. And maybe one of the guys up there was already with a super high salary for what they're doing. You just give them a raise. Their they're, they're, they're negotiated salary goes up. So their grant hourly resource rate goes up in, in, in proportion. Yeah. So yeah. giving it's the same, the just change the rate. How that happens, I, that, uh, that's a good thing because you, that, that's another retention tool you have. So there's this painful retention, this fear of loss. And there's also retention because you're doing a good job, we want to reward you. And they might generate sales. Two quick questions. Um, one, how does convertible notes paid out during investment rounds factor into this? And then the second thing is, how does deferred fees factor into this for, like, for example, if you hire a lawyer or an investor and they want something like that? Um, that's a nice foray into this next piece here, which is how do you, how do you outgrow it? Um, so when you outgrow, when you go out to the market and raise real money, so you're getting the convert convertible notes are great because they don't let they, they kind of skirt the issue, right? So when you raise you, the theoretical base value is just a pretend number. I want to go out and get my Series A to be two million dollars or four million dollars, even though our theoretical base value might be five hundred thousand. So that's what you negotiate, and then your note will convert at that rate. So you just convert it at that rate, just like you would anything else. Now, if it's a temporary, you asked about consultants earlier too, right? What I do with consultants is I just say, whatever your hourly rate is, we'll double it. But I'm going to give you a schedule for buying you out when I get the cash. So if, I, if, if, if you're 100 bucks an hour, I'll, be, I'll pay you the $100 an hour at the end of the first month. If I don't, I'll give you 110% of that, 120 and, and it works up over a year, at which point they would get equity in the pie. But that, that, is, that supposes that they're not, they're not going to be a long-term player. But they keep their equity because they were a consultant. Um, so there's a schedule for paying them off. Because you always want to have that option of paying them off. But if you're t you can't do that forever, there's a certain point where they, they own a piece. So I've done that with, with attorneys, and uh, I actually have some several attorneys that participate in funds this way, and that's how they do it. But so when you raise money and you get real revenues, you just start buying everything down. Just start paying cash for everything, and the equity model stops adjusting. Um, so just paying people is what really happens. So if you've got positive cash flow, pay your salary, pay for your truck, pay for your supplies, pay for your computer, all of this stuff gets paid for, then I don't need to use equity anymore, and then it freezes. And equity takes on a new life. Equity in a startup company is this risk that you're not going to get paid. Equity in an established company isn't the same kind of risk. It's more of an incentive, a bonus, a thing. It's not really, it doesn't represent this not going to get paid risk. So it becomes a sort of a different tool. It's the same th underlying legal mechanism, but it's, it has different value to a startup company's employee. Do you have a question over here? Uh, I was asking about, or I was wondering about whether people argue about having an idea that spurred on other ideas, like your dipping squirrels wasn't good, but you were still dipping something in chocolate, and then maybe that's what you know spurred on the banana. Generally speaking, 
the negotiated base rate should accommodate you know, the fact that you're going to come up with good ideas. So the junior guy out of college, we're going to assume that person with not a lot of experience is going to have less good ideas than the person, the 20-year 20, 20 ad, ad exec that's earning $200,000 a year. So we're paying for the person for the ideas. But if it's a game changer, then you can kick a royalty in. So that the pivot, what we don't want to do is reward bad ideas. So dipping squirrels is a bad idea. We don't want that person to get, royal, get anything up front. Because if he said dipping squirrels is the best idea in the world, and I want $50 million for it, then you just pay it out for someone that didn't have a good idea. If it's a good idea, it should generate revenues. So the moral of the story here is we have a program that eliminates this guessing about how much everything's going to be worth and provides concrete measures on how much the contribution was and the risk that was taken in order to get people where they want to go. That's why it's called getting them gators out of the equation. That was my last slide. More questions? The key to this thing, the, the beauty of this thing, I think, is your ability to start working with someone immediately. As long as they agree to the rules, we can start working together immediately. You don't have to worry about anything else. We just negotiate our salary and we're off to the races. And that is a very powerful thing because when you take other people on, the you, 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 minute you try to hire someone, you have this angst of what am I going to pay them? How much are they worth? What is, what's the equity going to look like? What's the split going to look like? It just prevents all that. Um, so what question on negotiating the salaries. The, the thing I'm still stuck on is how much royalty the, uh, the idea person gets. Like, that seems like a big deal, because it could be 5%, it could be like 20%. So each industry has some pretty standard royalty rates. In fact, if you look on Wikipedia and look up royalty rates, it's like, oh, this is the record industry, the publishing industry. So I have people who've licensed this book from me, and I take a 5% royalty. Because that's the going rate for a piece of literature, copyright or work in this industry. So you apply it in a technology format, 5%. Um, if it was some you know, game-changing patented technology that changed how people consume food, you know, that might be a higher royalty rate. So you, you negotiate that rate. But it's usually between, the general rule is 1% isn't enough, 10% is probably too much, somewhere in between there. It would be very rare if someone would take 25% royalty on revenues. And, and does, the, does the idea person like set that royalty and then whatever people sign up for, that's what they get? If the idea person is the founder, they would say, my royalty is 5%. Now, if they said my royalty is 35%, people coming to the company might say, that seems kind of bad, so I'm not going to join your company because of it. You've got to set it low enough that it's attractive to other people, but meaningful enough that it reflects the value you brought to the firm. And I get this a lot with solo entrepreneurs. They'll, they'll think what they put in before the team was formed is much bigger than it actually is. So you often have to adjust down. Because 5% of revenue is um, very different than 5% of equity. Right. It's 5% of revenue in the model. There's no fixed amount of any equity. Equity always changes. Is that, is that what you're confused? Yeah, it's never yeah. a fixed amount, yeah. yeah. So, and it goes in at 10% ten, at times 2 because it's unpaid royalty. I have two other questions. One, what do you do about, let's say, an employee who does really bad work consistently and somebody else has to redo that work? So basically double that time. Does that cut into their pie or do you not count the time that the employee previously put in? I would fire that person. I would give it, hopefully you've been monitoring it closely enough that you can get rid of that person. I generally don't try to take pie back and keep an employee on because it creates ill will. Um, and if that person is it going to be a performer, he'll change his, change his tune. If not, he will eventually get fired or she will eventually get fired. And my second question is, when do you recalculate the pie and how often do you do it? Um, I get people to do it every day. I get people to do it once a month. I get people, there's a guy in here in that's building a calculator. Every time you enter your value, the pie goes and recalculates. So it's whenever you want to. Um, if you're going to go out and raise formal money, you want to say, everyone make sure you get your timesheets. And I have one woman who says, everything's got to be in by Friday or it doesn't count. So I'll hire people to put it in so it's, it's flexible. It doesn't really matter when you do it, just as long as everyone's keeping it up to date. What you don't want to do is have one person like not do it for a month, and then all of a sudden they have a whole bunch, and you just want people to kind of keep, there's, there's spreadsheets and things you can use, or software. I was just wondering with uh, looking who's doing his job, this only goes in one direction, right? So it's because top to down. It's very hard for somebody who owns only 2% of the company to tell somebody who owns 30% of the company, you're not doing your job. How do we do with that? Well, the th person who owns 30% of the company is probably one of the leaders of the company. 
where the two percenter is probably an employee. So it's a typical management so relationship. We should be still saying, right, everybody has to do its job correctly, right? Right, everyone's got to do their job. And so if, you, if someone's not doing their job, it's not because this model's broken, it's because you have a management issue. You're not managing people properly. Okay. I mean, you could blame the, the 30 percent guy for not managing the two percenter very well, which is a common problem. I mean, startup companies, you know, they're like, they have, they have management issues. <laughs> There's no doubt. So this doesn't. This, this what this does is bring some of those problems to the surface and get and provides consequences for poor performance. Back. Can you clarify the difference between a founder versus an employee with this model? There's no real difference. Yeah. Everyone's in the same boat. Now in the other world, the founders have this. Is, it's a thing. They divide their stock up and they have founder shares and all these different. There's no real difference here. So, for the thinking about, for example, CEO salary, what if somebody's starting a company who has never done that type of thing, but they're going to start doing things that they haven't done before? And what exact job description are you going to be looking for? Like, are you going to be paying this guy what a startup company would pay a CEO? Or what do you base the salary of the CEO on? Well, you want to pay, so assuming that you're going to someday get cash, what are you going to pay that person once you get cash? That's the number. So if I'm right out of college and I make myself CEO and I give myself a $200,000 salary, it doesn't make much logical sense. So it's going to the mix of what their experience is, what the requirements of the job are, and things like that. So um, you want to pay a number that you'd be comfortable paying if you had the cash to pay it. Does that make, is that what you asked? Yeah, you don't want, you can't, like for instance, I, I, I personally, when I participate in these things, I cap my grant hourly resource rate at $200 an hour, which is equivalent to a $200,000 a year salary. Now, I, in my life, have made more than that per year. And I'm comfortable with the fact that I might be able to go out and make more money than that in a job. But it gets ridiculous if you ask for too much. So I just cap it at $200 an hour. So any startup company that wants to work with me, I say, my rate's 200 bucks an hour, and we're off to the races. Are there concrete boundaries between a group of people working on an, on an idea and a startup? Like legal boundaries, or what, how do you define those differences? When does a group of people working become a startup? And I guess in addition, when do you recommend, as part of the process of a growth of a company, you recommend to start equity splitting? This model works from day one. If you, if you haven't done it since day one, you come in six months later, you can, there's a model for retrofitting it and kind of determining what should, the shares should be. When your team starts working together, you're starting to work together. So that's when it's a company. It doesn't matter. There's no legal thing. It's not when you incorporate or anything. It's just you should just keep track. Um, start companies start when they start. And you just get together and start working on a common vision, and you're in business. So you, you value basically cash times four. But now the company comes in a little bit of trouble, and it needs extra cash and tries to go another round of VCs. Don't they have basically the playbook and saying, no, we want to five times the cash because you need it? And so they can actually dictate what the number is? Potentially. But it's not fair to the guys who put the money in earlier. Sure, but you know, it's business, so, right. you have so what you do is you, you negotiate your Series A pre-money valuation instead. You know, you know, when you go to your VC or your, seri your real money investor, not your, your angel investor, your real money investor, you, know, don't, you don't say, you know, you don't, you don't say we're, not, we're not playing by these rules anymore. Oh. We're playing by regular business rules. We're going to we're gonna generate some money that way. Have you done some ex like, post analysis on total startups? What if they have used, uh, had used that model? Like, how would it look differently? If they haven't done it versus what they had? In my class at Northwestern, I, have a, I designed a board game on this thing. It's called the Slicing Pie Game. And they beginning of the class, they do a fixed amount of equity split, they negotiate the fixed equity split, and then they play the game, and it takes them through the ups and downs of the startup company. At the end, it'll show them what would have happened if it was a dynamic split. And the only people who are upset about the dynamic split are the ones who would have made up like bandits with a fixed split. But they all agree that it's much more fair. I've never had anybody come back and say, we did this and it really backfired. I've had all kinds of people say, we did it the other way and it backfired. So that's where I'm coming from. Isn't there a problem if the company starts and it hasn't been there hasn't been a long time and you go to the series A because like it's a company that comes and looks at your idea and they're like I love your team I love your idea let's go and get this 
and you haven't actually put enough time, so therefore you're going to end up with almost nothing. Well, based on, like the idea, guys. I don't think it's a lot. Maybe it makes sense, but it won't that bother people who were on day one. The ownership is always 100 percent. So I have a deal that I did under this model, and we sat down. We had a couple of the coffees about this thing, and I spent some time doing some development for the guy, and we produced the product, and he came up with a customer right away. So we got we generated cash right away with the business. So we started. So now we can just pay ourselves for our time. So our split for the two weeks of non-paid time we got in, or is equal to about 50. It was more like 52, 48 when you did the numbers. You do it 50, 50 because we're getting cash right away. So our split was 50, 50. Um, so it doesn't matter what, what time. You th this just gives you incentive to get the cash right away. So if you and I start a company and you put 10 hours and I put one hour in, and the next day we get a cash advance for a million bucks, well, it's, it's, a, it's a 10 to 1 split, which is fair because you put 10 times as much as I did, right? Now, I would have liked to work a little harder the next day and gotten some more, but that's when we got our cash and it seems to start paying me now. Well, that's unlikely, <laughs> but that, 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 that's a scenario that did happen for us. Question back there? Okay, left. Um, I have a copy of my book there. I'd be happy to raffle off if anybody wants it. I also have a box of cupcakes that we're happy to raffle off. <laughs> the winner gets the book. The second place person gets the cupcake. Um, if you give me your email address, then I'll be happy to keep in touch with you. And I'll stick around afterwards. And I'm happy to answer more questions now. Great. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me.